quite often I'm approached by people in Arkansas, all over the country, with some version of the question, should I let my kids play football? Should I let my kids lift weights? Should I let my kids do this and this and this? And I think it's a very important question. Obviously, it's out there. Uh, I receive this question all the time. Um, but I think it speaks to a larger battle that's happening uh, deep in the American character. And this question reminds me, um, you know, I recall reading a great speech given by Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he was the governor of New York at the time this speech was delivered in Chicago, Illinois in 1899. Um, but he, he used this speech to describe uh, what he believed was the essence of the American character, uh, particularly the, the American masculine character. And he described that as the embrace of the strenuous life. And an excerpt from that speech reads, I wish to preach not the doctrine of ignoble ease, but the doctrine of the strenuous life, the life of toil and effort, of labor and strife, to preach that highest form of success, which comes not to the man who desires mere easy peace, but to the man who does not shrink from danger, from hardship, or from bitter toil, and who out of these wins the splendid ultimate triumph. Now, those are beautiful words, and I think it perfectly encapsulates the essence of Teddy Roosevelt, who would eventually become vice president. And then once uh, William McKinley was assassinated, he rose to the presidency of the United States. He was a man who exemplified that strenuous life. I encourage you to read uh, a biography of Teddy Roosevelt if you haven't already. Uh, this was a man who fought in multiple wars, um, he was a man who played uh, violent sports as a young boy, uh, as a young man. Uh, he embraced uh, a life of action, a life of adventure, a life of danger, a life of fighting for principle, uh, even when that came at great personal cost to himself. Um, you know, he, he famously left his job as, I believe it was Secretary of the Navy, uh, to create a cavalry regiment that eventually... Uh, found great success and honor on the battlefield of the Battle of San Juan Hill in the Spanish-American War. Uh, before that, uh, he, he was a, a politician, a young and rising politician in New York City. Uh, and upon, the, up, upon some political defeats and the death of his wife and mother on the same day, uh, he left New York and became a rancher in the Dakota Territories. Uh, before ultimately moving back to New York and re-embarking upon that political career. But he always uh, retained a fascination with the American West, uh, just with the, the raw and rugged and dangerous countryside of America, which is really deeply intertwined with the American character. And I believe that's what he was uh, speaking about when he described, uh, when he used that term, the strenuous life. And so, you know, that's really, uh, that's, it's an age-old question. It's still being asked today, I think, in our culture uh, which really rejects many of these masculine values and virtues uh, in favor of wokeness and leftism and communism. Uh, really, those things are, are the antithesis of the strenuous life. Um, you know, really, it's that, that doctrine of ignoble ease. You know, as President Obama said when he was in office, you know, he wanted more people to uh, have the ability to just sit at home and uh, you know, become painters and artists and not have to work and toil and do those nasty things. I mean, that's that's really that that doctrine of ignoble ease that Teddy Roosevelt described. And unfortunately, that has become more and more ingrained in American culture today. But we're fighting back against that. We're doing that on this podcast. We're doing that uh, in in the in the world, in the public square. Um, and so I want to address this question, which I, I believe, gets right to the heart of that issue, which is, you know, should my kids play football or should they train? And just to, just to back up, just at, at an overview, I, I, to, to give you perspective on this, um, you know, I, I can speak from personal experience. You know, I was, I was the, the grandson of a college and pro football player. I'm the son of a college and pro football player, and I became a college and pro football player. Um, you know, I was raised in a household that valued um, competitive athletics and the hard work and the grind uh, and the values that came along with that. So I am speaking from that experience. I, I fully admit that 
Uh, I am positively predisposed to that ethic, but you know, it's not just about becoming a, an elite level athlete. I mean, we, we all know the statistics, um, you know, it, it's extremely unlikely fractions of a fraction of 1% uh, of all young athletes even make it to play division one college football and even a fraction of those make it to play professional football. So if you're setting out the goal, uh, you know, for your son to play in the NFL, that really shouldn't be it. There's no, there's no shame in having that goal and setting that goal. I'll get to goal setting a little bit later in the podcast. Um, but you know, that really, that, that shouldn't be the ultimate end state. The ultimate end state for this should be setting the example for your kid and really giving him one of the most powerful weapons that you can give any young child, especially a young man, especially these days, which is instilling in him the idea that by preparation, dedication, proper planning and execution, that he can improve his station in life. That by doing those things, he has a certain amount of control over his destiny. And he's not a victim. You know, he is someone who uh, can shape his own future. And he has, he has power in that way. And that is, that really should be the ultimate goal of any kind of training plan, of any type of participation in strenuous sports, strenuous activities, in goal setting. It should be instilling in your children and your peers, quite frankly, um, that you have control over your own destiny, that you can improve yourself, that you are uh, setting up a benchmark and setting marks that go higher and faster and stronger, uh, you're, you're, you're creating a more elite version of yourself every single day. You know, I, I love the saying by Gary Player, the former golfer. I guess he still plays golf, but he was a, a great golfer back in the day, and he was really on the cutting edge of emphasizing proper diet and physical fitness uh, in the golfing world. This is back in the 60s and 70s before it was popular. Um, but Gary Player was doing that, and he always wore black. His nickname became the Black Knight, and he always wore black in the gym. And someone asked him one time, hey, Gary, why do you wear all black in the gym? And he said, well, because every time I go to the gym, it's a funeral for my former self. That, 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 form, that, that person is gone. The Gary Player of yesterday is dead. I'm, he, he's, we're, 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 his funeral is taking place in this gym because tomorrow... Once I've, you know, had a, a good night's rest, uh, had quality meals, when I wake up the next day, it's a new Gary player. And I think that's the attitude that you should have uh, every single day, that your goal, one of them, should be to wake up a better version of yourself who went to bed that night. So let's get right into it. You know, the, the first thing that parents should understand about training their children uh, in terms of weight training, in terms of um, you know, doing things that are kind of outside of the mainstream of just like kids playing sports, uh, like doing things uh, extra, um, is that, you know, before a certain age, about 12 to 13 years old, it varies per kid, but before the ages of really 12 to 13, your child is not really capable of getting that much stronger. You know, and it's simply because, um, you know, in, in young boys, they don't have the, the testosterone uh, that is necessary uh, in the, the natural growth hormone to actually see those gains. They're just not physically capable of making serious gains in the gym because, I mean, recovery is what equals growth, and that's what eventually equals strength. And without the proper amount of testosterone, you're not really going to be able to cover, to recover, and then grow. So really before that age of about 12 to 13, it should be all about enjoyment. It should be all about um, your kid having a great time upon his own initiative and interest. Okay, and that's that's really the key because if at any point your kid feels like he is being forced to be there, you know, whether that be uh, at a gym or, um, you know, doing extra, uh, you know, hitting practice for, for baseball or extra like golf lessons or, you know, what have you, uh, playing a sport, if he feels like it is an obligation, if he's not enjoying himself while he's there, he, he's going to hate that activity. And he's going to eventually resent you for making him do that um, like it's a job. And so, 
you know, that was, that was one thing that, you know, my dad from experience from his dad really understood that, you know, but really before age 12, it should be all fun and all play, you know, it's, it's, um, and that's how I developed. I, mean, I, I love sports. I grew up in a household that loves sports, but just, you know, on, upon my own initiative, sua sponte, I loved sports. I, I love to be outside all day playing all sports. I grew up playing everything, soccer, golf, baseball, basketball, uh, you know, what have you, with the major exception of football. And I, I think my, my dad was very wise to do that because he understood that from a young boy's development, you know, playing football, I, I don't think that playing football before the age of 12 or 13, you know, late middle school, early high school, I didn't play until I was a freshman in high school. Um, you know, it's, it's not inherently dangerous um, because the, the kids really aren't developed enough to do that much damage to each other, um, you know, especially compared to other activities they could be doing. So, so playing football before 13, I'm, I'm not saying don't do that, but um, it, you know, I, I, I think it's actually beneficial to hold them back until they are able to physically train to play the game of football the right way. And, and we'll get into that because as I described earlier, um, you know, before you are generating larger amounts of testosterone through, through puberty, you're just not going to be able to develop. And, you know, the game is, is just not going to be, it's not going to be a real experience of the game of football. And I think it also has the other added benefit of just kind of creating this, this growing demand to play the game. You know, by the time, you know, I, I wanted to play football from the time I was, you know, six, seven, eight years old, and I would play flag football and things like that. But, you know, I was chomping at the bit by the time I was 13 to play full on tackle football. I was terrible starting out. I mean, I was, you know, I wasn't even that good by the time uh, I was a junior or senior in high school. Um, but, you know, the, the good news was is that I had started uh, weight training and strength training um, at, you know, at around that age, 12, 13. Um, so I was physically in a position where, um, you know, I could play the game the right way. I didn't really have the skill set at that point. Um, but, you know, just based on, uh, you know, genetic factors, um, and the, the, the work that I had put in, I was a good college prospect. And so, um, that really kind of unlocked the, the key to my, uh, you know, potential to play in college. And, and really that, that's another thing that has to be addressed is that, you know, genetic factors play a huge role in a anyone's uh, ceiling when it comes to being a professional athlete. I mean, that's why, you know, in the NFL and in big time college football, you know, you, you don't see many defensive ends who are five foot six. You know, you don't see many, um, you know, linebackers who are 150 pounds. You know, there's a reason why, you know, you've got to be six four, six five, six six to play those positions. Um, at the highest level, because that's just kind of the genetic benchmarks. I mean, there are always exceptions. I mean, there there are you know some of the best uh, you know players in in college and NFL history at those positions. You know, some more smaller guys. But I'm just saying in general, in the aggregate, okay, there's going to be uh, a large uh, a large amount of the uh, you know in state of your child's uh, ceiling in terms of athletic performance uh, and how high he goes. It's going to be genetically predetermined. That's just that's just the reality of it. Um, but that should not be at all a discouragement because just I mean go back to what I said at the very beginning. It's about the process. It's about the journey. It's about instilling the values of embracing that strenuous life. It's about setting goals and achieving them. So let's get into let's get into goal setting. So. One of the best gifts that my father gave to me, uh, it was passed down from my grandfather, his father, was the goal sheet. It's something that I still do to this day, and I'll pass on to my kids, God willing, one day. Um, and I, I think everyone should have a goal sheet. Um, and really, I would, I, you know, I would give, I, I would start having my kids set goals around 10, 11, 12 years old. And those goals should be broken down very specifically and very intentionally. Um, they should be in three categories, athletic, academic, and personal slash spiritual. And they should be over four separate time horizons. So they should be three months, six months, one year, and three years. So in those three categories and in those four time horizons, okay, you're just going to have kind of a grid. And you know that way you have short-term, intermediate-term, 
and long-term goals. You know, any any shorter than um, three months is you know that's 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 really not worth uh, the effort and uh, you know putting out you know, goals that are that are you know before a, a three-month time frame. That's just too short-term. And anything longer than three years, you know, you'll just you'll have to adjust. Uh, you know, sometimes that it's, it's even three years, you know, one year is hard to project in a lot of ways. Um, but anything beyond three years is, you know, that's just, that's too far out into the distance. Um, but those, those four time horizons give you that short, intermediate and long-term, uh, methodology, and then the three categories. So let's, let's start with athletic. Um, you know, at, with all these categories, these goals should be, they should be very specific. Okay, you've got to give yourself, you've got to give your kids uh, something that can be measurable. You know, you, you, have to, you have to be courageous enough to put something on paper that you might fail at. And, and, and in many cases, you will fail at. Okay, like for instance, you know, when I was, um, you know, when I was uh, setting my goals uh, as I think like an eighth grader, I set the long-term goal to be an all-state football player. I figured that being an all-state football player would put me in a good position to earn a college scholarship. I, I never achieved that goal. Ironically, I was, I was all-state in basketball, but I was never an all-state football player. Um, you know, but just having that long-term goal out there, um, you know, was, that was just kind of the, the ring. I mean, another long-term goal was earning a, a Division I athletic scholarship to play football. And you know, those goals, um, you know, they, they evolved over time. You should revisit your goals every three months. Uh, that's another reason for that three-month time horizon. Uh, so you essentially reset and recalibrate. You evaluate the goals that you set three months ago, and you kind of see where you're at. And you know those goals again; they should be specific. So for athletic, you know, if you're talking about a young boy who's 10, 11, 12 years old, you know, for specific athletic goals, um, you know, around that time, you know, he should be in the beginning stages of some kind of weight training program. Um, you know, again, he's not going to be able to make huge gains, but he should be able to, you know, learn the proper techniques for the squat, the bench, the deadlift and the press, um, and just should, should have the, and that's not dangerous. I mean, don't let some idiot pediatrician tell you that lifting weights properly is dangerous. I mean, you're telling me that's more dangerous than going out there and playing football at the age of 11 or playing soccer. I mean, all these kids are, you know, you can, I mean, anyone who has kids knows, I mean, they can, they can hurt themselves in, in any way under the sun. So d don't let any doctor or medical professional or other, you know, overqualified, overcredentialed moron tell you that lifting weights is inherently dangerous. It is not. Lifting weights incorrectly can be dangerous, just like playing football incorrectly can be dangerous. But lifting weights at a young age is not inherently dangerous. So, you know, in terms of athletic weight training, you know, one thing that you should definitely be doing for your kid, if he's interested, is teaching him the proper form and fundamentals, and then setting goals in terms of very small, like one or five pound weight increases, um, you know, over, over that three month time horizon. So what you're doing when you have your kid in the gym, and by the way, you have to be setting the example as a father, as a mentor, as a coach, you know, whatever your relationship is, you have to have skin in the game. Okay. Because your kid's not going to want to do it. He's going to think you're fully, you know what, if you're just some out of shape fatso who can't lift the bar and you're telling him to do those things. Okay. He, he's just like, he's going to see right through that and say, well, dad, why aren't you doing that? So you have to, you have to walk the walk. He's going to be looking up to you. I mean, you, what, what you want to do is set the conditions. Like, again, I was so blessed enough. My dad did that. My dad worked out all the time and I saw him do that. And I was begging to go with him to the weight room. I would say, dad, will you take me to the gym? You know, dad, will you teach me how to work out? Because I wanted to be around him. You know, he was a big, strong guy, still is for his age. And I wanted to see how he was doing that. That was cool. That was interesting. That was masculine. And, and just by that, by setting that example, he was laying the foundation for, hey, Jake wants to embark upon a strenuous life. Okay, so these, these goals have to be specific. They have to be measurable. They have to be bold. Okay, again, don't be afraid to fail. Okay, and, and like show your kid that like, hey, you know, yeah, if you didn't achieve this goal in this time frame, okay, let's recalibrate what went wrong. Okay, why didn't we achieve that goal? You know, like wh why, why didn't you make the varsity team? Okay, why didn't you have a 25 pound increase on your squat or your deadlift over the last three months? Okay, you know, why, you know, why aren't you playing, you know, why aren't you on the starting five on your middle school basketball team? Okay, and then you go down to the process about how you get there. 
And again, so I cannot emphasize enough that until about that age of 12 to 13, it has to be about just pure joy and on the kids initiative. Where it changes is, is around that, that, that age, 12 to 13, where hormone, hormones start to come into play, testosterone, and it's time for little Johnny to start becoming a man. And, you know, part of becoming a man is, is learning what it means to work. And again, I was blessed enough to have uh, a father in the home who taught me that, hey, you know, hey, Jake, you know, he, I remember this conversation like it was yesterday. I was 12, 13. I think I was about to turn 13. And it was essentially, you know, in a loving way, it was like, you know, hey, playtime is over. You are coming to an age where it's time to learn how to be a man. It's time to learn how to work. And, you know, I, I was fortunate enough that my dad gave me an option, an option that my grandfather didn't have because growing up in the Great Depression, he had to work, um, you know, work a job. But my dad gave me the option. He said, hey, you're going to work. I'm going to give you the choice of how you want to work. OK, you can work as a job. You know, you can make money. Um, you know, you can, you know, start working after school or before school in some type of enterprise and, and start to you know, get into the economy, get into the marketplace, start earning money. Um, you can work that way. You can work into, uh, you can work in a, a separate extracurricular activity of your choice. Um, you know, if I wanted to pursue music as a, as a profession, if I wanted to pursue something where I was dedicating my, you know, all of my, my spare energy and time and effort and dedication uh, into something like that, that was available. And another option that was available, another avenue was sports. And of course, by that time, you know, I was, I, I was ready to go. I was, I was, I couldn't wait to start playing football and I decided at that time, with my father's encouragement, that I wanted to pursue sports like a job, you know, like a profession. I mean, it, it seems kind of silly to, to think about, but it, it's true in a way that, you know, I was a professional athlete at a, at a relatively young age. I treated it, not because I was that good. I was actually terrible at football at the very, at the very beginning. I was always athletic in other sports, but I was really terrible at football for a while. But I treated sports like a professional. And, you know, what does that mean? I mean, that means getting up earlier than everyone else. That means doing things before school that other kids aren't doing. That means do, during, doing things during school that other kids weren't doing. That means doing things after school that other kids weren't doing. And, I mean, to illustrate that, I mean, just here's like a, a day in the life of me when I was in high school and, you know, people ask me, Hey Jake, like, did you go out in high school? Did you drink and do all this? Like, like, no, I didn't have time to do that because my, I mean, my schedule, I had set that goal, um, you know, that I wanted to be a division one college athlete and I wanted to pursue sports as a, a, not as a career, but like a profession, then I, you know, I had to work hard and I had to dedicate myself and I had to, um, do things that other people weren't willing or able to do. So I would go in first thing in the morning at 6 a.m. To, to the high school, Catholic High, and I would do speed drills um, with a guy who worked with our, uh, with our sports program, okay? And we would do, um, you know, really a, a lot of it was technique work uh, in terms of, you know, how to be a, a better sprinter, how to be a better runner. Um, eventually, we, we specialized into... Uh, football specific drills, particularly drills that um, football coaches evaluate, like the five ten five agility drill, the L drill, uh, the the ten yard dash, and the forty into the forty yard dash. Um, and so, you know, I, I really honed and perfected my craft um, in the morning. You know, when other people were sleeping, and so then like during the school day. I mean, like, even during the school day, I was a you know, a very dedicated student, but I wanted to maximize my time after school. So I had to maximize, maximize my time, my effort while I was in school. And so every spare moment, like even during classes that um, I was kind of ahead in or like during our, our study hall sessions at Catholic High, I was doing my homework and studying for tests the next day so that when I was done with school at 3.30, I was done for the day. So I was very intentional about how I spent my time during the school day. And so then, you know, after school, I would go to a football practice or basketball practice or offseason football, whatever it was. I mean, I can, I can say this honestly that, you know, and I, I laughed about it at the time, I didn't come home from school at 3.30 when the bell rang. I, I didn't come home when the bell rang after school until like April of my senior year of high school, like after the basketball season ended. 
I mean, it was like, and I had no more offices in football because I was about to graduate. Like that was the first time in my entire high school life that I went home at three thirty. I mean, that's that's kind of a good benchmark for for you know the parents of high school age males. Like your son should not be coming home at three thirty. Period. He should be working a job. He should be in some kind of a sport. He should be doing something that like occupies his time. So he's learning that that day doesn't end at three thirty. That day ends when work ends. And really that day didn't even end when work ends. Like for me, like, so I would come home and I remember this, I mean, I've still got the Jersey. Like I was to say, I'm coming home from, from basketball practice. I, I played high school basketball on a pretty good high school basketball team. I mean, they won the state championship after the year after I left. So, I mean, I guess the missing piece was getting rid of me, but I would come home from basketball practice in my, still in my sweaty bas- uh, practice Jersey. And I would go straight to our, a uh, little shack we called the dungeon in our backyard, which was our gym at home. And we had a power rack and some dumbbells, uh, a, a glued hand machine. And, you know, I would get after it with weights after school, after practice, um, before dinner. So, I mean, that was, I mean, like from the time I woke up at 5.30, 5.45, whatever it was, got into school, I was working out during school. I was preparing for my uh, post-school activities, practice and weights. And then after school, you know, like it'd be just, I would, you know, I remember going to basketball practice and I had Joe Klein waiting for me. Uh, his son, Daniel was, was on our high school basketball team. And Joe was kind of a volunteer assistant, uh, high school coach. I mean, a, a guy who played like 12 years in the NBA, uh, won a, won an NBA finals, uh, has an Olympic gold medal. I mean, he was like coach, you be the low post. And I would come, you know, straight to practice early to basketball practice to work with Joe doing mic and drills with a medicine ball. So, I mean, you think I was exhausted at night when my head hit the pillow after doing, you know, extra football training in the morning, a full school day, you know, extra work with Joe Klein, basketball practice, an extra weight workout in the evening, dinner, and then it's time to go to bed. I mean, that was, that was a, an average day for me in high school. And that, that's the level of dedication that it takes to, to I mean, like, obviously there, there are people who are genetic freaks. And, you know, they can, you know, they can slack off and still make it to a certain extent. But I can tell you that at the elite level, I mean, at the at the SEC and the NFL level in football, you know, pretty much everyone who makes it there knows how to work. I mean, like being a genetic freak only gets you so far when you're in the elite of the elite because everyone's a genetic freak. I mean, everyone is, you know, dealt that same uh, you know, a hand of good genes that just gave them the ability to be there. But really, it's your it's your work ethic and your drive and your intelligence that allows you to stay. And, you know, just for people, I, I tell the story a lot, um, you know, about people who um, are always looking for an edge. I mean, Tom Brady, you know, he's he, he's one of those guys who, you know, in the, the first team meeting of the year, you know, the first team meeting I ever participated in as a New England Patriot on this new rookie, it was like May, we're about to start spring mini camp, and there's Tom Brady in the front row center with his notepad out, scrib- scribbling furiously uh, in his notepad notes from Bill Belichick's just opening kind of like nothing meeting to the season. You know, like, I mean, Bill's kind of giving just kind of a generic, like, okay, like, here's our expectations. You know, the team had lost the Super Bowl the year before, so they were just, you know, that really the mantra was, you know, kind of finish the job the next season. And there's Tom right in the front row, right center, where everyone can see him. And the guy's sitting up in his chair. He's taking notes. He's paying attention, even in kind of the lightest, most introductory meeting of the entire season. That's a man who's looking for an edge. That's a man who is setting the tone. That's the man who is a leader. And it's no secret that that's the greatest quarterback of all time. And, you know, part of that, yeah, genetics, Tom Brady is 6'5". He has all the tools, but it's also encapsulated in his work ethic, his goal setting, and everything that we've been discussing on this podcast. And, you know, one more thing um, that is important in raising kids, and, you know, I was talking about this with a buddy of mine this past weekend, diet and nutrition is a huge part of this. That was an element, you know, I, I should probably do a separate podcast on this. That was an element of my training that wasn't neglected. I just didn't have the intelligence. I didn't have uh, the inherent knowledge to really have a great diet when I was uh, in high school. Uh, I really kind of revolutionized my diet when I was in college because I realized I was just, I was searching for the next edge. I was like, wow, these guys are really good. Uh, I'm never going to be able to play here unless I find the next edge. 
And one of those edges was nutrition. And I, I was thinking about this when I was talking about Tom Brady. He's a guy who was always on the cutting edge of nutrition. I mean, even the great training table that we had in New England, Tom Brady always brought in his own meals separately in his own cartons. And, you know, he was, I mean, Tom was, he was on the cutting edge of eliminating or, or at least like greatly reducing uh, his exposure and his kids' exposure to harmful chemicals. I mean, everything that's out there in our food, in household cleaners, laundry detergent, the water, I mean, everything out there is poisoning us. I mean, we, we all know the stats and the numbers, um, you know, about how low uh, relative to, uh, to, to recent history, how low the testosterone count is in the average American male. And I think a lot of that is due to these, just this mass combination of toxins that are in everything that we encounter. And so Tom, I mean, he was, you know, he was using like natural deodorant. He was like using, um, you know, like things that, like everything that touched his body or went into his body, uh, like to the greatest extent possible was all natural and was, was, was purged of all these chemicals. Because, I mean, there's a man who's always looking for an edge. And, you know, in modern life, like, it's really hard to, you know, ensure that everything your kids are exposed to are, uh, you know, are, are low chemical products. But you can be intentional about it. Okay, that's the point. Like, it's about trying to find those, those, those edges, those inches, you know, that, that add up. That at the end of the day, those are the things that, you know, even if they don't make a huge difference on an individual basis, just the process of thinking about it and doing it and showing your kids that you're looking for that edge, that you're willing to fight for that edge, you know, that you are willing to do the things that other kids are not willing to do. I mean, that's, you know, my grandfather, he pulled me aside one day when I was a kid and he, he, he made, he told me that saying and it just made perfect sense to me. He said, you know, if you like, if you think you're working hard just by going to to basketball practice with your teammates after school, like you're you're full of it. Like that's not working hard. You're just all, all you're going to do is improve at the same rate that everyone else is improving at. And that's not even accounting for kids who are doing things on their own time extra that you're not seeing. So I realized pretty quickly, like, hey, like I'm not necessarily the most gifted athlete in the history of the world genetically. So I'm gonna have to do things. And, you know, my dad was able to help me find things to do that other kids were not doing, that they weren't able to do, they weren't willing to do, you know, they, they would rather be doing something else, going out, drinking, partying, like going down to the river, like, like whatever it is, like I, you know, I, I did, you know, I didn't do those things because to me, that was only going to be a, a detraction from my ultimate goals. And so like, it, I, I hope through this podcast, you see how all these things work together. And, you know, really at the end of the day, it's up to you. It's up to you as the parent, as, as the father, uh, or the mother, whoever's listening to this podcast, it's your decision about your kids, but I'm giving you these coaching points about the things that you should be looking for. You should be looking for a kid that's having fun. You should be looking to see, uh, if your kid is showing initiative, showing desire to do things above and beyond what other kids are doing. You should be setting the example for your kid in terms of your diet, nutrition, rest, your training. You know, you should be showing your kid what right looks like, okay? And he should be chomping at the bit to emulate you, to, to be like you, to do what you are doing. And then you can, you can, you can raise him in that way. You can coach him up, okay? And there, there are no more beautiful moments that I cherish with my dad than, you know, us being in the gym together, us being... Uh, you know, at the track together at the field, you know, we would go, you know, on the weekends, you know, when I was a kid, we go to the track down at Hall High, Scott Field in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, we would jump the fence and go train out there. And, you know, occasionally people would come down and try to chase us off or, you know, they'd be asked, they'd be asking us like, what the heck we're doing. And, you know, we would like my dad and I would just kind of laugh like they just they don't get it. Like, like we have we have goals in mind, we have an in state in mind. And that's the attitude you kind of like, that, that you and your kid have to have that kind of buy-in together mutually, um, you know, to achieve those goals. So, you know, my my closing advice is yes, you should allow your kids to pursue things that are going to result in a strenuous life. And it's not just the activity; it's the mindset. It's the mindset that 
you know, as a, as a young man, I'm going to specifically search out things that are going to challenge me. And I had this mindset, you know, that has been instilled in me through my experiences in sports, in the military, in life, in politics, that, you know, if I'm, if I dedicate myself, if I uh, am intellectually engaged, uh, if, if I work my butt off, then I have a, a greater control over the ultimate outcome than others do if they weren't doing those things. And that's really what it is. It's about finding an edge. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this podcast. Again, this is a, this is a different topic, but I, I hope you're getting a flavor about some of the things that we're going to be delving into. It's not just going to be news of the day. It's not just going to be, you know, the daily political chatter of the Teletubbies. We're going to be diving deep into these issues that are much more existential. They, they have a longer time horizon um, because that's where it starts. I mean, it starts in the home. That's where culture has changed. It starts in the home. It starts in the church. Um, and it has to be God inspired. And, you know, again, that's, that's one more thing that, um, you know, it, that, that should be recognized is that, you know, you should feel, you should feel at peace doing this thing, that doing those things. Um, you know, it's, it's like the great line from Chariot to fire, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. And, you know, you should, you know, your, your kid should have that mindset. You should have that mindset that when you are doing those things, that when you are embarking upon that strenuous life, whatever it is, that you are feeling that, that warmth of God's pleasure because he likes it when he sees his children uh, toiling and working hard and, uh, you know, instilling those values that, as Teddy Roosevelt said, are the best of the American character.